Okay, good evening, everybody. A pleasure to be here. Yeah, Carl gave me this title, probably the longest title that I've ever had, so I'm not sure that I can live up to it when you see all those words there. And, uh, this, uh, I always put my website on this first page, and for some uh -oh. reason it didn't get put on there. I'm not sure why. But anyway, uh, if you want a copy of this, uh, later, if you don't have a paper copy, just go to my website. The easiest way is just Google NDSU Livestock Economics and then go to Presentations. And our server was down today, so my secretary didn't get it on. I'm not sure if it's on yet, but it'll be on tomorrow as, as, our, uh, as, as it comes up. So uh, I also have a cattle outlook and some others on there, but I've just got a few slides to show today and try to cover very quickly just this long topic. Um, we did have a government shutdown, obviously, and as Carl said, it had a huge impact on the information available on the cattle markets and also affected uh, price risk management a lot. Thankfully, the government shutdown uh, stopped and they started, the government started up today, so we're going to, by next week, then we'll see more and more stuff. When I put this slide together here a couple days ago, we didn't know when that was going to happen. But anyway, the... Uh, the cash market has not been reported in the month of October yet. Again, we have USDA market reporters in North Dakota, uh, periodically at West Fargo, and then at Napoleon, Kiss, and Mandan, and Stockman, so we haven't got an official uh, report. I was watching Napoleon today like uh, Carl was too, and, and doing other anecdotal uh, looking at prices, and, and more on that when we look at the chart, but they, they have been inching up. But Unfortunately, we don't know officially what prices have been doing either on the feeder cattle side or on the fed cattle side, but next week uh, that will all be remedied. The uh, CME feeder cattle index that I'm going to talk about some today is an average of a, uh, USDA AMS prices all over the country, including our markets here in North Dakota. It's used to settle the feeder cattle futures market, and we haven't had, a obviously, a CME cattle index since September 30th either, either because it's the average of all these AMFS prices. Um, so we're wondering if it continued, uh, what's going to happen when we get to the end of the month, uh, last Thursday, which this year is October 31st, is when the October feeder cattle futures contract matures, but that's all taken care of. Uh, it's also, of course, used to settle LRP contracts, and, uh, and uh, so uh, LRP has been shut down all this month, too. Uh, since prices are going up, I think they're probably higher than any LRP contracts that would have been locked in, and so there wasn't a payout anyway. If there was, now they'll uh, get at that here in the next week. And the last reported index on September 30th was 159.89. Now this is an average price of all 650 to 850 medium and large frame one cattle sold at all those markets AMS reports. That was record high on that date, and uh, so on. You know, unfortunately, we haven't had it since then. We do think the market has moved up, and again, we have to wait till next week to find that out. And so uh, I already mentioned LRP insurance, and, and Carl mentioned has not been available. And uh, however, that'll I'm not sure if they'll start up tomorrow or not, but uh, probably will. Also, there's supposed to be a USDA cattle and feed report out tomorrow, and uh, uh, you know those surveys go out at the end of the month, and so that's as would have been as of October 1st. Obviously, that did not get done, and so there's no report tomorrow. Just heard today that. Uh, again, the end of the month, they're, well, they're going to do the surveys now and actually put it out the end of the month because uh, NASA is back at work now. So we're back to getting information and things will be moving along uh, smoothly as we near the con end of the contract and we'll know what cash prices are next week. It's just we're kind of in a void now and a little more on that later as well. Of course, the big driving thing on feeder cattle prices the last several years has been corn prices. Another thing that really comes into play uh, on, on uh, feeder cattle prices can be fed cattle prices, but we've had a very, very uh, stable fed cattle market. If I have time here, I'll just show you that. 
uh, those, that slide in a minute, but it's corn. Change in corn price has been the big driver in feeder cattle. Just take you back to last year, and uh, again, we were up here at 164 in, in June on feeder cattle, and we were down uh, at uh, 520 on corn, and then last year we had the drought, and corn soared from 520 up to 820, and feeder cattle crashed in one month from 164 down to um, five, or down to uh, 142 or so. So, um, when we're talking about price risk management, I think this is something to really keep in mind because the market adjusts very quickly to fundamentals, and it can, and it can catch us off guard. So, just another reason why we might look at price risk protection. Of course, this year it's a tale of two worlds, and it's just the opposite. Here's the same thing: November feeder cattle and December corn. This year, I've got the entire year here to show you. Uh, you know, that opposite effect when corn goes up, feeder cattle goes down in a different direction. But again, just go back here, if I can get this cursor to work, just go back here to June 15th, which would be the same time period on my previous slide, and we've had basically the opposite situation. Corn fell from up there 570 or so down to the current 441, 443 today, and feeder cattle have responded nicely, contra seasonally, and uh, you know we went up then from 150 up to the current to about 167 on that November feeder cattle contract. And so again, last year, cattle price is down because corn going up and this year corn going down and feeder cattle going up so you know high prices are the cure for high prices and low prices are the cure for low prices and that's absolutely what went on in the cattle industry then uh, this year is reaping the rewards from that. Uh, look at the 556 weight calf prices and I have a number of lines on here this line on the bottom if yeah, I don't know what you're uh, projector might show, but it's kind of an aqua line is the 2011 average. Then the green dash line is 2011. Then this uh, uh, high point here at the first of the year was last year, this purple line. And, uh, and then the red line is uh, this year. And so, uh, you know, a couple of comments. We were record high on these calf prices a year ago during the spring, a lot of things going for us, good grazing conditions and obviously a short supply and other things. And then we got to the drought here and, you know, again, we see that uh, very rapid ratcheting down of prices as the grazing conditions went poor and, and the corn crop all of a sudden went, to, the conditions got very bad. Now, you know, in this year then, uh, we struggled the first part of the year on calf prices simply because we had record high corn prices and it was very dry. It was very dry in North Dakota until the end of May and, and you know, then when, when a lot of the conditions improved throughout the country. I know we had dry spots in North Dakota the rest of the year too and down through the South Central and from Carrington on down. But we've had this nice seasonal uh, contra seasonal, I should say, pick up in, in calf prices. Uh, they are record high for this time of the year. They're not all time record high. However, you see that occurred back in the spring of 2012. But we've inched up. And again, uh, in October here, I've got a couple of just dots here. The market has went up. We really don't know how much. I'm, you know, like Carl said, we're at 174, 175, and we'll get a lot more information next week to uh, analyze that. But anywhere we're, we're at record high prices, you know, uh, corn, you know, we've got a record corn crop coming on. Looks like it's going to materialize. And if we can get a little bit of uh, fed cattle have been going up and get a little more spark on them, uh, probably won't see the seasonal weakness that we usually do, although we probably see a little when the big runs hit. But anyway, we're going to end out the year quite likely at uh, record high prices. And then when we go to next spring, we could mirror again 2012 as long as it rains and we have good grazing conditions. And I didn't bring the drought monitor map along, but we have the best conditions now in the U.S. It's dry out in California and stuff, but even Texas, Oklahoma down there have gotten a lot better. So, you know, it looks like quite a bit 
uh, higher prices uh, like 2012 next spring and they could even be higher uh, next fall because we're going to have really short supply. But again, that's a long way out and it depends on corn. Go to these heavier weight yearlings then and kind of the same thing. I won't go through all the different years and so on because they're kind of uh, parallel to what I talked about on calves. But we've had this green line is this year compared to last year, the aqua line, we've had this nice contra-seasonal increase. And we are at all-time record highs on these heavier weight cattle uh, that are even above what they were in the, back in the spring of 2012 there. So they're, you know, up there, $160 was the last at the end of September. And again, we think they've moved up to around 165 uh, since then. The other thing on this chart are the uh, futures. Here's the October futures and November futures and then uh, next year's futures is the blue line on top. But kind of notice, I'm going to mention this in a minute, but kind of notice um, how even there. One is, of course, predicting the futures market, at least is saying record high prices throughout next year, but very little uh, volatility just straight across on those futures, which typically does not happen. We see seasonal uh, price changes and as much as $10 difference, and this is all the same, which really affects uh, put premiums and LRP premiums that I'll talk about in a minute. So uh, again, we're there at record high levels. I know we're just talking about backgrounding today and not necessarily slaughter steer prices, but I throw these in because, again, that's the other variable that gives us feeder cattle prices. And if we can get fed cattle prices higher, that's supportive to feeder cattle uh, prices. And, and the fed cattle market has been moving up. And again, in October, uh, it looks like we're up there, uh, you know, 120 eight or so, 129 look, we're going to do this week and the next week then again we'll get, start getting the reports in. And the futures, the darker uh, blue or aqua are the futures uh, this year moving on up to above 130 by December. And then uh, for next spring showing one up and around 135 or whatever, uh, there's some caution there because a year ago this time when I was talking to you, we had fed cattle futures up there and they never did materialize. You see, here's the aqua line is the actual cash market it was 125 to 1267 all spring and then much of the middle part of the year here we've been 120 to 125. So the fed cattle futures way under or the market way underperformed what the futures was saying last year, but the futures again are back up there at 135, so that's kind of a caution too. So here's that CME feeder cattle index, and I kind of moving more into price protection, kind of show you this. Again, this is the average price of all 650 to 850 weight uh, steers. It's not heifers, but all steers sold in the U.S. And typically we had this seasonal price pattern where from if you go up from September, first of September, uh, here this nine every year, five, six, that is the high for the year. And then going down, we see that seasonal decline into March, go with the threes here, three, one, oh, six, oh, seven. We see about that 20% decline price and now we still backgrounded cattle in and we could background cattle just fine and just we had to be aware that the seasonal price pattern was downward and maybe some price protection was warranted. Then when we move on to the uh, 2000, or 2010 and 11 and 2011 and 12 actually were really really good backgrounding years because prices went up. And so actually we ended up getting more for the cattle that we priced in, the more dollars per pound, and, and we had price went up. Last year's John, you know, we, we had kind of even from September 1st in, to March, as John said, uh, wasn't as good a year. Last year it all depended, though, when you priced your cattle in and out backgrounding. If you priced cattle in about an hour before now, 550 weights at at 150 to 155 and priced them out in January at 750 uh, at, uh, at uh, 
uh, the price Zen about 140, 145. You made money if you didn't price the 550s in till into November, particularly into December. They had went up to 160, 165, and didn't bring them out till March. Uh, the market had fell to about uh, 130 by that time. You see here by by the end of March. And so uh, there you lost money, so it all depended. Now this year, again, we brought the index up. We're record high, 159.92 was the September 30th price, and since then we haven't had one. And so, you know, what's the price pattern going to be this year? So uh, just a little bit here. I, I do have a budget on my web website that you can use. And again, uh, Carl mentioned CAF Web and a variety of places to figure your break-even price. I just took my budget on my web and again used a whole different uh, series of prices here. And John uh, mentioned those prices. Mine at today is 363. Just the, earlier in the week, there was 354. And mine at Washburn Ethanol Plant today, or or for uh, corn 398, Hankinson down here 408. So we're somewhere again, like John said, pick your poison of corn prices of whatever suits you. And and Carl also mentioned this. And John, I think that you know the futures now is in that 165 area. So certainly. You know, for background in calves, it looks like it's profitable uh, at that 165 and stuff. But again, lower that price down, and we lower profits. And so that's kind of what I want to talk now a little bit about is some price protection and and wrap it up. Again, uh, it's nearing Halloween. We have the Wicked Witch, and when it prices before for cattle have gotten record high, we have all these different things that come in and cause prices to go down and. And I'm not saying that they're going to happen, any of those are going to happen, or something that we don't know about is going to happen, but it could happen. And um, so, uh, again, just a word of caution to keep in mind and why you might want to use risk protection. So, there are several different price risk management tools that we can use. We can use a cash forward contract. Feedlots are really, really after the uh, heavier weight cattle. Uh, and uh, and uh, we see that in the price, and uh, we have uh, a, a lot of reasons for that. We have a very uh, limited supply, and, and um, even for the lighter weights, we've got winter wheat pasture this year, and again, looks like fed cattle price is going up and so on. So feedlots are really after cattle, so they will forward contract the price. You can price your calves to a... Uh, to a feedlot for feeding to slaughter weight. Now, for later delivery, January, February, whatever, we can do video internet markets, we can do the futures, we can do options that already was mentioned. Uh, livestock risk protection we did not have here for this, uh, you know, for the last few weeks, but it's going to fire up again, so we'll have livestock risk protection available. So it's whatever fits your marketing plan and what you're comfortable with and, and understand. Um, if you're just learning, I do like livestock risk protection because it's easy to understand. Everything is up front. You can do steers or heifers. You pick the number ahead while you go up to an options or futures contract. It's 50,000 pounds. Uh, steers only, again, the cash settlement price. So, again, not enough time today to explain all these, but uh, there are quite a few tools available to us. Always ask which is the best. And I don't have the audience in front of me, but if I did, I'd say, how many of you think prices are going up? How many of you think prices are going down? How many of you don't know what prices are going to do? Well, that's the key to what uh, price risk management strategy is the best. If you're absolutely sure that there's going to be an uptrend in prices, you don't need price risk protection. Stay in the cash market. If you're absolutely sure there's going to be a downtrend, do the futures or a cash forward contract or a video auction. In other words, price them now if you know they're going to go down. If you don't know what they're going to do, that's where options and LRP are good because with those you set a floor price but not a top price. Again, with the futures cash forward contract and video, you set a price 
and then you're locked in at that price. If prices go up, you don't get at the higher price, but if you go down, if they go down, you're protected. Options in LRP, if prices go up, fine. You can take advantage of the higher price. In hindsight, they will always be second best because you paid a premium uh, for them, and if the market goes up, uh, you should have been only in the cash market. If the market goes down, you should have uh, been in the futures or forward contract in them, so it'll always be second best. But it'll be a close second, only from different from the first by the amount of your premium. So, again, seasonal prices do favor price protection in backgrounding because from September there, prices usually do inch down into March, and I'll show you the chart in a minute. They did it last year, 2010 and 11, 2011 and 12. They did not. Instead, they went up, and again, that was ideal for backgrounding. And, uh, you know, so uh, what's going to happen this year is, is a good question. There's a... You know, the future says they're going to stay pretty stable, and uh, so we'll have to follow that. Is it worth it, then, was the other question. And, uh, again, it all depends on your own situation. Actually, options put in LRP premiums are low this year uh, compared to history simply because we've got that very low implied volatility from the futures market. These are a day or so old, and the October futures did fall off a little today. But again, look at very, very, and I showed you on that chart, very little variability for the next year. So that causes, that less volatility causes premiums to be lower. We talked about this before, you know, and at the money Put there a 168, uh, 168 January put about 370, an LRP 164 at $3 on September 30th. Again, tomorrow we'll get a new one, but you know, those are all within the range that Carl talked about. Compare that to last year where we were locking in $150, it was costing us $2 more, so it is a little cheaper. Again, uh, go to last year just as a caution. Here we are in the middle of October at around 152. We did get them higher by the end of the year, and so again, those cattle sold, background to cattle sold early in January, did not need price protection and did fine, but those backgrounded cattle coming out, the longer you kept them, the worse they were, and, and then price protection was warranted. So uh, I'm going to quit there.